The Psychology of Criminal Conduct, Chapter 3. From criminal Criminology Theories to a Psychological Perspective of Criminal Conduct. The search for theoretical understanding is a search for general, rational, simple, and empirically accurate explanations of variation in criminal behavior. General explanations are ones that apply to a number of specific observations. For example, a general theory of criminal conduct will account for a variation in both violent and nonviolent offenses <clears throat> and will do so for men and women of different ages, races, nationalities, and socioeconomic origins. Rational explanations are ones that withstand logical analysis and are internally and externally consistent. Internal consistency refers to how well the assumptions and explanatory variables fit together within a theory. External consistency refers to how well a theory fits with other scientific theories. For example, a theory of criminal behavior may take internally consistent use of certain biological assumptions, but it would be less than satisfactory if those assumptions were at odds with reasonably well-established theory in the broader biological sciences. Simple explanations are ones that make relatively few assumptions. The most important aspect of theoretical understanding, however, has to do with the empirical support for the theory. Here, we are especially interested in the cause. Theories try to explain the relationships between among the variables of interest and as Hunter and Schmidt, 1996, point out, these explanations are always casual. In PCC, a practical goal is the rehabilitation of justice-involved persons. And you can only treat effectively by knowing the, me the mechanisms of behavior by focusing on the casual var variables suggested by theory. We have the potential to influence criminal activity through deliberate interventions. For example, does the delivery of intervention programs aimed at improving family relationships actually reduce criminal futures? Before outlining the general personality of and cognitive social learning, GPCSL theory, the psychological perspective of criminal conduct used in this, con in this text, a brief overview of some of the important criminological theories that influence GPCSL is in order. Many of the criminological perspectives in their original formulations situated the root cause of cr crime in one disadvantaged position in society that is a product of poverty, social class, race, or some other indicator of social location. Societal imbalance and injustice are seen as the cause of crime. The criminological theories have must, much to say about criminal conduct, but they do not give a complete and empirically satisfying explanation. There are also psychopathological theories that view criminal behavior as inherent to the person and see the cause of crime as a psychological disturbance. However, a fuller discussion of psychological theories is reserved for chapter five. We begin with the criminological theories. Criminological theories. From the 1930s to the 1980s, the dominant criminological theories took on a class-based sociological perspective to delinquency. Noteworthy are strain theory, subcultural theory, labeling, and Marx's conflict theory. These theories hypothesize that social class of origin is a major source of variation in illegal conduct at the individual level. However, as the evidence grew showing that social class was a relatively minor correlate of criminal behavior, see resource note 30.1, some of the theories evolved to include social, social psychological factors, other criminological theories, control theory, and differential association did not locate the cause of crime in social class, but in the f failure by the immediate community to ensure conformity to pro-social norms. Resource note 3.1, social class and crime. 
Perhaps no single variable has been more important in criminological theory than social class. Many of the major sociological theories of crime and delinquency were, the theor were theories of crime in the lower social classes. The origin, uh, origins of crime were to be found in being lower class, disadvantaged, poor, and frustrated in trying to acquire that what the middle and upper classes have. Title Villamez and Smith, 1978, were the first to question the strength of the class crime link through a meta-analysis of 35 studies that examined the class crime link at individual level, thus avoiding the ecological fallacy, technical note 2.2 in the textbook website. Studies that characterize individuals in traditional measures, personal or familial, familial, occupational, educational, and income, the socioeconomic status, SEC, as well as the class structure of their areas of residence were included. The important question is whether decreases in SES are associated with increases in the proportion of criminals. The 35 studies yielded 363 effect size estimates for various combination, combinations of race, sex, and other factors. Title ETL used the gamma coefficient to calculate their, si their effect size, but one can inter interpret it similarly to an R. The average effect size was negative 0.09, a relatively modest relationship between class and crime. In addition, the mean effect sizes were in the same range for women and women and whites and non-whites. Title and Tittle and his associates recognized that some of the individual effect sizes were strong and negative, even though the average effect size was weak. Similarly, some effect size estimates were actually positive in sign, suggesting that under some circumstances, increases in SEC were associated with higher rather than lower levels of criminality, a finding opposite to the to that predicted by class-based theories. Further analysis found that the class crime relationship did not depend on the t type of offense. However, the magnitude of the association did vary with how criminality was measured, self-report versus official records, and with the decade in which the study was completed. The mean effect size from the self-report studies was small but larger. For studies of official records, the relatively large effect size for official records was traced to studies conducted prior to the 1970s. Before 1950, the mean effect size <clears throat> was a whopping negative 0.73, but then diminished. After 1970, the effect size dropped to plus positive 0.004. On the other hand, the effect sizes based on self-report criminality were relatively constant over time and small in magnitude, ranging from negative 0.03 to negative 0.11. This was interpreted interpreted to mean that in the 1970s, there was essentially no relationship between class and criminality, as evidenced by the marginal effect size estimates for both self-reported and official measures of crime. One may have existed prior to 1950, but that may have reflected crime, criminal justice processing effects rather than criminality, thus explaining the large effect size in the early studies when official measures of crime were used. Title e Tittle's ETL's 1978 general findings have been replicated by a number of reviews of the literature post-1978 and by more direct tests of the class crime link. However, re recognizing a weak class crime link does not dismiss the real problems of the poor, nor does it deny the existence of crime, high crime neighborhoods. What the recognition of a weak class crime link does not does it does is to remind students, scholars, and policymakers that the socioeconomic context makes a minor contribution to a variation in crime relative to a host of other personal interper, interpersonal, familial, and structural cultural variables, including the immediate situation of action. There are other approaches to understanding the relationship between crime and class. 
One approach is to specify the possible conditions under which a relationship may exist by focusing upon the levels of di disposable income available to individuals at particular periods of time. What are the implications of having some loose change in your pocket or purse? Some Americans studies suggest that relative wealth in the immediate sense is a correlate of juvenile delinquency. However, it is the delinquent who tends to have more money than the non-delinquent. String theory. One of the earliest examples of string theory is Robert Merton's 1938-57 theory of limited opportunity. Merton hypothesized that social structures exert a strain upon certain persons to engage in deviant behavior. Deviant behavior is said to occur because the lower social class has limited opportunities to achieve the goals of society. In America, the dominant aspiration is to which all people are socialized or which people come to share was said to be a success, money, property, and prestige. Anyone can grow up to be a president and the legitimate route to success is working hard in school and on the job. The power of this aspect of the theory is clear because it is nothing less than the collective myth of the American dream. Counter to the dream, however, is the fact that access to the best schools and well-paying jobs are unavailable for many members of the lower class. Thus, criminal behavior was conceptualized as an innovative route to the same rewards that conventional employment would bring if only legitimate channels were available. Instead of labeling those in conflict with the law, as Deviant Merton called them innovators, innovation was not the only way to adapt to limited opportunities. The other adaptions was or retreated treatism, mental disorder, and substance misuse. Among the real down and outs of society, rebellion attempts to create a new social order on the part of the more able and intellectual within the poor lower class and ritualism. The mindless grinding way of, me, of the working poor who have transferred the dream to that of their children making it. The notions of an uh, anomie and strain enter as mediating variables between the disjunction of legitimate means and the pursuit of illegitimate means for traditional th strain theorists. The psychological mediator is anomi, that is feelings of alienation arise from limited opportunities and become the motivation for crime. For these theorists, criminal behavior reflects awareness of limited opportunity and feelings of alienation, isolation, powerlessness, normlessness, and personal distress. In 1992, Robert Anu, 1992, de-emphasized the role of social class in the path of de deviance with a more psychological explanation, frustrations and difficulties at home example the abusive parental discipline school example conflictual relationships with teachers and work the example frequent unemployment are the indicators of a strain crime link a new calls his perspective general strain theory gst and the sources of negative effects that is anger rather than alienation extend well beyond an aspiration achievement discrepancy in the arena of conventional success gst has taken a, on a more psychological explanation of crime with a particular interest in negative emotionality and personality characteristics such as low self-control subcultural perspective subcultural theorists spoke primarily of young lower class women who conformed to the lower class subculture in which they were located as in limited opportunity theory, persons in the lower class are excluded from the mainstream culture and as a reaction, of sub, a subculture is formed. This culture de devalued conventional routes to success and valued hedonism and destruction. While Merton's people were allowed to I I innovate within subculture theory, criminal behavior is conformity. Stealing was conforming to the criminal subculture of using drugs was conforming to the retreatist subculture and fighting was conforming to the conflict subculture. Cohen 1955 examined the content of the values and norms said to be dominant and in deviant subcultures. He suggested that criminal subcultures shared prominent 
procriminal attitudes and values in direct oppositions to such middle class values as delayed gratification and respect for property. That is the major of major values were immediate gratification and short term hedonism, hostility and aggression. Furthermore, dropping out of school and not working were, not, were seen as acts of defiance toward middle class values. Miller 1958 was still more informative in his specification of the content of criminal sentiments. He viewed the following focal concerns as peculiar to the lower classes, trouble, generalized difficulty, toughness, physical prowess, masculinity, daring, smartness, outsmarting others, autonomy, independence, not being bossed, fatalism, luck, and excitement, thrills, danger. One can see that having such values and attitudes can lead to conflict with the, the rules of mainstream society. <clears throat> Just as a new distance strained theories from social class, Mata 1964 became concerned that the class subculture link was an inadequate explanation of crime. It appeared to overpredict delinquency among the young lower class males, and it did not account for the delinquency of occupants of higher social positions. The solution to this problem it was to give credit to psychological factors. Mata referred to an impetuous impetus that realizes the criminal act. The impetus comes from the being pushed around, which then leads, <coughs> excuse me, to a mood <clears throat> of fatalism and a feeling of desperation. Not everyone is exposed to and affected by this impetus, but for those affected engaging in delinquent behavior, it serves to overcome these feelings and provide a sense of control and power. Sykes and Matza were less inclined to, than subcultural theorists to accept the image of the delinquent as one committed to criminal values. They suggested that delinquents know that certain acts, if detected, will be punished. However, they are enabled to act antisocially by engaging a set of ver verbalizations that function to say that in particular situations, it is okay to violate the law, referred to as techniques of neutralization. Note that these verbalizations may be used prior to action, may be considered casual as causal, causal. Their use is not limited to deflecting blame or controlling guilt after an offense has occurred. Labeling and Marxist conflict theories. Labeling theory and the Marxist conflict theories see crime as a result of the powerful and in society selecting the less powerful the poor and minorities for official criminal justice processing, i.e. being arrested, appearing in court, going to prison. It is the upper classes that make the rules of society and everyone breaks these rules, but not everyone is subjected to criminal justice processing. Becker, 1963, Sure, 1973. It is, the advantage, it is the disadvantaged in society who are targeted by the criminal justice system in labeling theory once processing begins the offender the offender develops a self image of criminal of being crim a criminal called secondary deviance if one believes he or she is a criminal then he or she begins to act like a criminal and self fulfilling prophecy is launched note that labeling theory begins with class location but quickly turns into psychological cognitive processes the best way to manage crime, according to labeling theorists, is to do, do less. Later in the book's book, we will see that minimizing contact with the criminal justice system can be the right thing to do, but not for all who come into contact with the justice system. Control theories. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the control theories, the crucial explanatory issue is why don't we violate the law? rather than why do we violate the law. In brief, it is conformity rather than deviance. That must be explained. Walter Reckless, 1967, suggested that there were both outer and inner sources of control. The external controls were social pressures to conform and the strength to, of these controls would increase with a sense of belonging to pro-social groups. These groups include the family, social clubs, schools, 
and religious organizations in our containment is reckless term for what psychological psychological psychologist call self-control psychologist okay sorry call self-control and he listed five indicators of inner control one positive self-concept that involves not only self-esteem but also seeing oneself as conventional as opposed to criminal a commitment to long-range legitimate goals three setting realistic objectives high tolerance for frustrations number four Number five, identification with law, lawfulness and respect for the law. From the perspective of social law, sociological theorizing, the major theoretical significance of reckless theory was that the social networks of young people constituted something more than socioeconomic status and subcultural membership. He also gave ascendancy to psychological mechanisms related to internal control and to the recognition of individual Differences in Socialization, Travis Hirsch's, Hirsch's Causes of Delinquency, 1969, a class cross-sectional study, Recall Chapter 2, assumed that there are individual differences in morality for Hershey. The moral ties consist of attachment, commitment, involvement, and belief in the validity of the law. One, attachment to are caring about the opinions of family, teachers, and peers. Commitment to conventional pursuits involves increasing the risk of losing one's investment should, devi should de deviance be detected. Involvement in conventional pursuits reduces delinquency simply by the limited time available for deviant pursuits. Belief in validity of the law refers to individual differences to the, in the extent to which people believe they should obey the rules. Noteworthy is that Hershey's ideas involve rejection of the causal, causal significance of social class. Able to draw upon the post-1950s research evidence, Hershey acknowledged that class was at best a weak correlate of delinquency. Surprisingly, Hershey downplayed the role of delinquent associates, which is the empirically weakest of his theoretical positions in his own survey. The students were asked, have any of your close friends ever been picked up by the police? Of those who answered that they had no friends picked up by the police, only 7% were delinquents. However, for those who answered that they had four or more friends known to the police, 45% were delinquents. Hershey's four-factor theory places an overemphasis on ties to convention, underemphasizes ties to crime. Only procriminal attitudes are included and procriminal associates are excluded and regulates relegates the temper, temperamental personality variables such as self-control, taste for adventure, and hostility to background factors with unspecified linkages to either crime or convention. In 1990, in collaboration with Michael Gottfredson, Travis Hershey further modified his views, ties to convention, and per criminal attitudes, belief in the legitimate illegitimacy of the law were minimized and self-control was emphasized Godfredson and Hershey's 1990 general theory of crime suggests that one construct low self-control accounts for stable individual differences in criminal behavior. Hershey's control theory was continued to evolve. Godfred and Hershey. In the early 1990s, self-control was the tendency to avoid acts whose long-term costs exceed their monetary advantages. Apparently, every day people calculate the long-term costs in advance, in advance of the moment of behavioral action, in some ways an economics rational man type of theory. However, in 2004, Hershey re refined self-control as the tendency to consider the full range of potential costs. Now, cause and effect are at least con contemporaneous. This is to pr be preferred over an effect that precedes that cause. In addition, by considering the full range of potential acts, social bonds return to control theory. Example, the cost of losing friendships. More will be said on self-control in chapter five, antisocial personality pattern. 
differential association theory. Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. There is much of immediate value within differential association theory. Simply stated, a person becomes delinquent because of an excess of defin definitions favorable to violation of law over definitions unfavorable to violations of law. Furthermore, the importance of the per criminal associates resides in a fundamental theoretical principle. Criminal behavior is learned by associations with criminal and pro pro-social others, and the principal part of that learning occurs in interaction with other persons in a process of intimate communication. Thus, the casual chain in classical differential association theory is from pro-criminal associates to the acquisition of the pro-criminal attitudes to criminal behavior in particular situations. When a theory identifies powerful correlates of criminal conduct that are readily validated empirically, it deserves serious attention, interest increases further when the theory has obvious practical value for purposes of prediction and prevention. An attractive aspect of differential association theory is the inclusion of two well-validated correlates of criminal conduct, pro-criminal attitudes and pro-criminal associates. This evidence is highly relevant to differential association because a central causal assumption of differential association is that criminal acts reflect cognitions favorable to criminal activity. Every perspective on crime reviewed gives causal status to pro-criminal attitudes. Even Merton's original statements regarding structurally induced anomaly were qualified by a footnote to the effect that alienation would not lead to criminal acts if there were internalized prohibitions against law violation. Summary of criminological act theories. Social location was, for many criminological theories, example, limited opportunity subculture labeling Marxist conflict. At the root of the crime, the strain and frustration of not being able to achieve success through the legitimate means pushed some to pursue illegitimate ways to obtain success to create subcultures where the behavioral expectations could be more easily achieved or to accept and act upon the label of criminal. From a practical perspective, the major risk factor was socioeconomic status as indicated by income, race, age, and gender, and the prevention of crime was the redistribution of wealth and equality, especially in access to work and education. For the control theorist and the later strain theorist, social class is a minor consideration. Crime, crime is a failure to develop control over behavior and the control comes from oneself and our social network. The example, parents, teachers, employers, here are the major risk factors. Our poor self-control disturbed interpersonal relationships with family and friends and poor educational and work success. With these theories compared to the social location theories, there is a wider range of possible possibilities for assessment and intervention. And finally, we have differential association theory and differential association theory, those with whom we associate and what we think are key to understanding criminal behavior. The major risk factors are pro-criminal associates and pro-criminal thinking. And if we are to intervene, then we must target these two risk factors, reducing interaction with delinquents and increasing interactions with pro-social individuals is the goal of treatment. But on exactly how to do this, Differential association theory is silent. The how of change is left to the principles of learning in a social learning psychology, psychology of criminal conduct. Toward a general theory in PCC, social learning theory and criminal behavior. Social learning theory advances the how of change in accordance with well-established principles of learning. These principles will be described in shortly in the section entitled The Principles of Learning and Criminal Behavior. In addition, most, be most of behavior is learned within social context. One of the earliest examples of the application 
of a social learning perspective is the reformulation of Freud's frustration aggression hypothesis by Dollard and his colleagues, Dollard, Miller, Dube, Moore, and Sears, 1939. Instead of aggression being an unlearned response to frustrations for its view, Dollard and his colleagues argued that, the aggression, that aggression is a response to frustration if aggression was rewarded in the past. Furthermore, as a result of consequences to behavior, other responses to frustration may occur. Example, one works harder to deal with the frustration, asks for help. Albert Bandura, more than any other psychologist, established social learning theory as the dominant perspective in psychology to explain the acquisition and maintenance of behavior. He rejected attempts to marry psychoanalytical theory with a learning approach and criticized learning theories for minimizing the importance of observational learning. This latter idea of watching a model performing a task and what happens as a consequence is extremely important. Learning through observation requires internal cognitions and information processing in order to anticipate the con consequences for behavior. Thus, Bandura rejected the radical behaviorism of Skinner. With the introduction of, the, of his concept of self-efficacy, i.e. beliefs in one, uh, one's ability, Bandura 1977, the transformation to a social cognitive theory was complete. In criminology, Sutherland clearly saw the value of social cognitive learning, i.e. learning of definitions and social groups. However, he was unable to articulate the mechanisms of learning. Unfortunately, Sutherland promoted criminology as a subdiscipline of sociology, and he not only minimized the contributions of psychology, but was also quite hostile toward biosocial explanations of criminal behavior. Wright and Miller, 1998. However, addressed the weakness in Sutherland's theory and at the same time, revitalized the social psychological perspective within criminology by arguing that differential reinforcement is the learning mechanism for criminal behavior that is, criminal groups that model and reward pro-criminal attitudes and behaviors outweigh reinforcements for pro-social behaviors. Akers later introduced a macro-social factors such as social disorganization that have their own influence in the micro-differential reinforcement mechanisms. His social structure, social learning theory became very influential within criminology. A general personality and cognitive social learning theory of criminal conduct. Generally, pers personality and cognitive social learning, GPCSL, has many s similarities to the social learning perspective just described. GPCSL also assumes that criminal behavior is a learned behavior. It is learned within the social context and the learning follows established principles. It is different from Aker's theory in the temper temperamental and personality factors play a larger role. Thus, GPCSL is more in the tradition of Bandura's theorizing. We begin our presentation of the GPCSL theory by directing the reader's attention to figure 3.1. In this figure, the major psychosocial biological factors that influence and maintain criminal behavior are schematically summarized. The model recognize, recognizes that there are multiple routes to involvement in illegal conduct, which is because the model identifies personality, temperament, and family relationships as correlates of criminal behavior it does not assume. For example, that all young offenders that are restless or aggressive, or that all young offenders are weakly tied to their parents. GPCSL theory gives a salience to what is called the, the central eight risk need factors. They are criminal history, two, pro-criminal attitudes, three, pro-criminal associates, four, antisocial personalities, five, family marital, six, work, schoolwork, seven, substance misuse, and eight, leisure recreation. This is a far cry from Hirsch's single factor theory of poor self-control or any other theory that attempts to explain criminal behavior by one or two con constructs. The central eight risk need factors are described full, more fully in table 3.1, but it is important to note that all of these factors, and I will be coming back to these just so you know, all these factors influence 
the decision to behave criminally. In the first five editions of the psychology of the psychology of criminal conduct, a distinction was made between the first four risk need factors called big four and the remaining moderate four. This was based on the findings from a prediction studies, mostly with general offenders, where the first four factors displayed higher effect sizes than the other four factors. However, research from the past decade with adults, and there's a lot with adults. Oh my goodness gracious. Okay, this is a lot of youth, adult youth, the mentally disordered, racial minorities, illicit drug use, users and a combination of the aforementioned have not found this demarcation between the big four and the moderate four. Nevertheless, the central eight risk need factors are consistently observed across the meta and analytic reviews. Therefore, in the sixth edition present presentation of the big four was replaced with the central eight and remains so in this present edition. The specification of a th history of criminal behavior notes the importance of not equating risk or of offending with seriousness of the current offense. The indicators of risk are early involvement and extensive history, a variety of antisocial activities, nonviolent plus violent offenses, and rule violations while under supervision. A major error in assessment is to score seriousness of the current offenses offense as a risk factor it is not a major risk factor in and of itself a serious and violent offense becomes an important risk factor when it is combined with a history of violence the seriousness of the current offense however is an aggravating factor in sentencing in the sense that the more serious the injury imposed by an offense the more severe the penalty just punishment and risk of of reoffending reflect different concerns. The description of antisocial personality pattern APP uses everyday language. A more precise language will be described in subsequent chapters. APP in regard to risk need typically involves at least two relatively independent dimensions. One is weak self-control and a lack of planning. The second is negative emotionality in the sense of irritability, feeling mistreated and being antagonistic. It is important to note that the trait measures of APP assesses, assess these pre predispositions as relatively stable enduring factors. However, self-control and negative emotionality may also be assessed as acute dynamic factors. Acute changes such as an angry outburst are highly important in a GPCSL understanding of variation in criminal activity. Finally, the personality research is very helpful in identifying factors that have very little to offer in understanding individual differences in criminal activity. Considering so misunderstand misunderstandings of crime and criminals, that are widely and actively promoted, it is quite helpful to attend to those aspects of personality that are not associated with criminal activity in a major way. These weak non-criminogenic factors include happiness, self-esteem, social sociability, feelings of anxiety and worry, and psycho psychopathology. We will be returning to these issues throughout the text because misunderstandings of those involved in the criminal justice system are so common. It appears that some happy people break the law, but many do not. Some sad people commit crimes, but many sad people do not, and so on. Reflecting on figure 3.1 and considering the central eight risk need factors, the reader will observe that the chances of illegal conduct for an individual increase Dramatically, as the number of the, eight, the central eight factors increase, GPCSL also suggests that pro-criminal attitudes and associates may be particularly important risk factors as reflected in the proximity of these two variables in the decision to act criminal, criminally. <coughs> Excuse me. A meta-analysis focusing on the core va variables within social learning theory did not did find large effect sizes for attitudes and pro-criminal associations. It is premature to speak 
of a big two without conformity evidence. However, when we return when we turn to our discussion of rehabilitation in later chapters, an argument can be made that these two risk need factors may need, indeed have added practical relevant relevance over the this uh, the other central eight factors. Immediate causal significance is assigned to the cognitive decision to commit a criminal act. Some theorists speak out of defi definitions favorable to law violation. Others of self-efficacy beliefs, behavioral intentions, and the balance of rewards and costs. It remains to be seen whether operational distinctions among assessments of these variables may be differentiated in construct validity studies. The main problem for the field may be settle, settle to settle on common vocabulary. So far, assessments of behavioral intentions and self-efficacy beliefs have impressive predictive validities in many different situations. The major sources of variation in judgments of appropriateness and the decisions to act are a combination of the immediate environment and many of the central eight risk need factors. The immediate environment consists of faci facilitators and obstacles to criminal conduct. For example, a person is less likely to steal a car if it is locked rather than unlocked. The person scans the environment as part of judging whether or not a central behavior will be rewarded. Of course, if the attitudes and cognitions held by the person are supportive of criminal behavior, there is social support for be for the behavior either perceived and or direct assistance there is a crimin there is a history of having engaged in criminal behavior and the person has relatively stable personality characteristics conducted conducive to antisocial conduct example anger and poor self-control then the decision to act criminally becomes very likely where do social class social structure and culture fits fit into this general personality and cognitive social learning of crime because they are con constants they are const constants and <laughs> sorry they are distal background contextual conditions that can cannot account for variation in an in individual conduct within particular social arrangement such as social class not everyone in the lower class Social class is a criminal. What explains the variability in criminal conduct is the distribution of the central eight risk need factors in interaction with the reward cost contingencies that are in effect with each particular social arrangement and understanding of how rewards and costs modify and maintain behavior follows. You go ahead and turn this back because you're gonna need this information. Should you want to pause the video and write that down? And then here is the central eight risks, need factors. Should you wish to pause this, this is important notes. <laughs> and then here is table 3.1 continued. Okay. The principles of learning and criminal behavior. GPSCL with other varieties of social learning theories that all behavior, including criminal behavior, is learned, having identified the major social and interpersonal sources of criminal conduct, i.e. the central eight. The question then becomes, how is criminal, excuse me, behavior learned within these settings? The answer lies in the principles of learning, and here are the concepts of rewards and costs of our fundamental a reward is any stimulus that increases the probability of behavior and a cost decreases the likelihood of behavior. Note that the word cost is used rather than punishment in order to avoid unnecessary negative emotions associated with the word. We usually think of the rewards and costs following a behavior referred to as an operant conditioning to psychologists. For example, an employer may give a financial bonus to an employee for working particularly hard, or a parent may scold a child for not sharing a toy. However, our cognitive, cognitive <laughs> can't say that word this morning, ability to anticipate an outcome brings 
the control of a reward or cost before the behavior influencing the likelihood of the behavior occurring. This type of learning is usually the result of experiences that associate a behavior with rewards or cost. Poclovin, Vienne, or class, classical conditioning. We call these signal rewards and costs, and they reflect the internal cognitive control of behavior. We may turn off our cell phone when entering a theater because in the past, others in the audience shouted at us when our phone rang. Entering the theater signals that turning off the cell phone will avoid a potential cost. Models also serve as signal rewards and costs. For example, we are more likely to jaywalk after walking to another do it if that model is expensively dressed or as opposed to being shabbily dressed. All behavior, criminal or not, is under the control of rewards and costs that come either prior to the behavior or after it. In any situation, the con contingencies of rewards and costs are re responsible for the acquisition, maintenance, and modification of human behavior. It is also important to note the important role that internal thinking processes play in, in learning. For signaled rewards and costs to control behavior, for the formation of memories is necessary. Memories store information, rewards and costs associated with behavior for later use. Most psychologists and cognitive scientists follow an informative information processing model of memory that follows three basic steps. First, to form memories, one must attend to the behavior and the outcomes. Second, the information must be retained, usually through rehearsal and practice. Finally, the information is retrieved when needed. As the decision or discussion highlights, that humans think, and that is why cognitive is in GPCSL theory. The antecedents and consequences are two, of two major types, additive events, Rewards costs are introduced, extended, and augmented. In subtractive events, rewards costs are withdrawn, postponed, or diminished. Additive rewards are consequences that add something pleasing to the environment. Example, delivering praise to a child for a valued act. Subtractive rewards are consequences that remove something unpleasant. The example, the ch chances of an assault requiring will increase if the assault was successful in stopping someone from behaving undesirably. Additive costs augment or add something unpleasant. Example, a slap on the face for an unwanted kiss. Subtractive cost, remove pleasantness. Feeling sick after drinking excessively. The point to remember is that a reward leads to an increased likelihood of the behavior re reoccurring while a cost decreases the chances. Resources Note 3.2 provides an example of additive and subtractive rewards in operation. Resource Note 3.2. Here is a case study. Should you wish to pause? There we go. Sorry about that. And here is the second part of the case study. So you can read that at your leisure. There are no universal rewards and costs for that work. For everyone in all situations, maybe a reward for one person, maybe a cost for the next person. What may be powerful reward for one individual may mean little for another. A masochist may enjoy physical pain, but not a non-masochist. A hundred dollars may be very motivating to a person with no money, but not for the millionaire. What acts as a reward or cost depends on a range of factors. They include genetic dispositions and capability. Example, the reward power of cocaine may be dependent upon on the presence of certain neuroreceptors, cognitive functioning. The example, a cost occurring days later requires the ability to think in the long term. Human development example, a cookie is more effective than a dollar for a one-year-old and state con conditions. Example, scolding is less effective when the person is intoxicated than when the individual is, is sober. There are many physical and cognitive characteristics of the person that influence the capability to respond and learn. Sometimes these person factors are permanent. Example, brain damage. Sometimes they are transistory. Example, developmental and matrirational matri changes and sometimes they are acute. The example, intoxication. 
feeling mistreated in a particular moment, in particular situation. B.F. Skinner recognized that rewards and costs may operate on different schedules. A reward or cost may follow every occurrence of the behavior. The example of pain every time you touch a hot stove at fixed intervals, example of paycheck every two weeks or seemingly on a random basis, example the jackpot from the slot machine. When and how often the rewards and costs occur can have a tremendous effect on behavior. In GPCSL, this is called the density of rewards and costs. Also important is that when we choose to act in a certain manner, we are foregoing other alternative behaviors. When a when prosocial alternative behaviors are, excuse me, I'm sorry, my book keeps one to, are highly rewarded, the motivation for some forms of deviance may be reduced. The potential for reduced criminal behavior resides not so much in reduced motivation for crime, but in the potential for dramatic increases in the subtract subtractive costs of crime. As the rewards of non-crime increases, the individual has more to lose. For example, when we choose to get up in the morning to go to work, we also forego the pleasure of sleeping in. Why do we go to work? It is because the density of rewards are for going to work. Money interacting with coworkers, receiving praise from the employer outweighs the cost of sleeping in, losing our job, not having money to pay for food, housing, and recreational pleasures, and enjoying the company of fellow workers and employers. With respect to crime, variations in the probability of occurrence of criminal behavior are a positive function of the signal density of the of the rewards for criminal behavior and a negative function on the of the signaled density of the cost for crime the probability of criminal behavior is also a positive function of the signal density of the rewards for prosocial behavior and a negative function of the signal density of the cost for prosocial behavior if the rewards for the criminal behavior are perceived to outweigh the rewards for prosocial behavior and there are few costs for criminal behavior, then criminal conduct is the likely result. The impact of altering the density of rewards and costs is greatest at the intermediate levels and less as less so at the co the extremes of very low or very high densities. Adding one more reward or cost to a behavior that already has many rewards or costs will not make much of a difference. Antecedents and consequences arise from three major sources. One, the actor personally mediated events. Two, other persons interpersonal personally mediated events. And three, the act itself, non-mediated or automatic and habitual events. The strength of personally of personally mediated influence is maximized when the person is highly self-controlled self-control skills and when personal cognitions attitudes and self-efficiency beliefs are either supportive of criminal behavior likelihood of criminal criminal behavior or supportive of prosocial behavior likelihood of prosocial behavior personally mediated control is weakened when cognitions are neutral the strength of interpersonally Mediated influence increases with adherence to the relationship and structuring principles. The relationship principle states that if other is respected, valued, and liked, the effect of interpersonal influence is enhanced. The structuring of the structuring principle states that the direction of the influence is determined by the pro-criminal versus pro-social nature of the other's cognitions, expectations, and behavior. As an illustration of the interaction between the relationship and structuring principles, think of two children both living in warm and loving family. The children both love and have the both, excuse me, the children both have positive relationships with their parents. However, one child has parents in conflict with the law who encourages and model so antisocial acts while the other child has parents who never have been in involved in crime. You can see how the former child has a higher likelihood of engaging in delinquency. Non-mediated influences are relatively automatic. They come from the act itself and primarily reflect a history of reinforcement for the target behavior. The repeated and heavily rehearsed associations of other stimulus events 
With reinforced behavior, the stimuli may also come to exert automatic control. Thus, as examples, simply thinking of a significant other may influence the occurrence of behaviors preferred by other the other or the very act of ingesting a drug produces sensory change. Table 3.2 summarizes the key types and, social, and sources of control. Up to this point, the importance of rewards and costs at the, in the immediate situation has been stressed. However, rewards and costs are also dependent upon historical, geographical, and political economic factors. Recall Edgar's macrosocial factors, the, av the availability of rewards and costs, and the rules of delivering for delivering them vary from society to society and according to the, socio to the economic, social, political conditions inherent in a particular so society or culture. To illustrate a society with high employment cannot provide sufficient rewards for pro-social behavior through jobs, thereby making an alternative antisocial behavior as a means to earn money more, more attractive. From a normative perspective, cultures will vary on what they expect from their members and what they will be rewarded. Consider the behavior of drinking alcohol. The rules under which alcohol consumption is sanctioned can vary across cultures from drinking only under strict ceremonial conditions to displays of public drunkenness, our social settings, our communities, and our culture significantly influence what is rewarded and what is punished. Here is the table 3.2, should you wish to pause and, and write that down. A glimpse at the evidence supporting GP, CSL, and Central 8. Theorizing is of little value if it is not supported by empirical evidence. In GPCSL, the central eight are highly relevant, while some other sociological and psychopathological factors are less relevant. Throughout the text, a range of evidence in support of GPCSL will provide for now one meta meta-analysis in support of GPCSL in resource note 3.3 is presented. Here's the resource note. Here is the graph. Mean R, type risk need, and various control variables risk need. In summary, in the context of GPSL, CSL, crime cannot be understood without understanding whether the personal Interpersonal and community supports for human behavior are favorable or unfavorable to a crime. It is not sufficient to highlight the accumulation of rewards and satisfactions. Strain theory and subculture theory and the imbalance of power of social power, labeling and conflict Marxist theories. It is also not sufficient to highlight the extent external and internal controls on criminal behavior, both motivation and control must be considered within the context of person factors in order to understand criminal behavior. Worth remembering, one, historically, sociological criminology has been dominant force in theories of criminal behavior. Some of the theories placed in the individual's location in the social hierarchy as a cause of crime. However, the evidence shows that social class is a minor correlate of criminal conduct. Other criminological theories have taken on a more social, woo, sorry, social psychological approach. Self-control, pro-criminal associates, and pro-criminal attitudes were seen as more important than social location. Three, a general personality the, a, and cognitive social learning, GPCSL. Theory postulates eight major risk need factors called the central eight. They are one, criminal history, two, pro-criminal attitudes, three, pro-criminal associates, four, antisocial personality pattern, five, fam family, ma family marital, six, school work, seven, substance misuse, and eight, leisure recreation. The effect size for the central eight risk need factors is larger than for social class and personal distress. For GPCSL assumes that criminal behavior is learned in accordance with the principles of learning and behavior is under antecedent and consequent control. 
variation in criminal behavior is a reflection of the density of signal rewards and costs for criminal and non-criminal alternative behaviors. Six, the sources of signaled rewards are personal, interpersonal, and non-mediated. Cognitions play an important role in the control of behavior. A major feature of GPCSL is the strength of its implications for the design of prevention and rehabilitation programs. Here's the recommended readings. And that is the end of chapter three. Yes, that's the end of chapter three. Thank you.